She is an actress, a philanthropist, a New York Times best-selling author. Her brilliant memoir, The Beauty of Living Twice, is available everywhere right now. Please welcome the one, the only, Sharon Stone! <laughs> Sharon, I'm so happy to see you. It's so good to see you. I'm so happy you're here in person. How are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm out. Yeah. I'm out in the world. Yeah, does it feel weird? It's so great. It's but nice to see you from afar. It's nice to see you from this distance. It really is. I like you over there. I'm so happy that you're... <laughs> Do you know what? I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> Me There's too. so much to talk to you about. You've had... An ex you're having an extraordinary year at the moment. You're, yeah. You have a best-selling book. And you've also, and I don't know if people know this, you've released a new single, yeah. a song that you wrote, which yeah. I don't think many people know about your music career. Tell me about this. Well, it's kind of been my side hustle for quite a while. I've had number one hits in several other countries, but I didn't want to, well, also, let's face it, nobody's going to let you in to the music business here just because you want to. Sure. So I had to prove myself elsewhere. And it, it just happened this year that a song I wrote, uh, the lyrics for a wonderful artist named Haley Sales, um, hit, and it went really well up to, like, number four on adult contemporary charts. It's called Never Before. And so I got music managers, and my Robin Thicke just took a few songs for one of his artists. It was over my house the other day, which <laughs> I'm bragging. I'm name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend I'm not. <laughs> and my songs are going out to people, and it's really exciting. It's incredible because you're doing lots of writing, not just, <laughs> not just songs and music. We have to congratulate you on the incredibly successful memoir, The Beauty of Living Twice. Thank you. I have to say, Thank you. just like personally, I've, I've loved seeing the, the outpouring of love and <laughs> support that, that you've had for this book. Have you enjoyed the response that you've had from people? It was one thing writing it. I don't think I was prepared for the concept that people would actually read the book I wrote. So when they started reading it, I started panicking. Like, oh, no, people are going to read my book. But I didn't really think that a lot of people would read the book. But, but I think people have responded to it because you write so honestly about every sort of corner and facet of your life. Like you talk very poignantly about about the, the, the near-death experience that you had and you saw the white lights. Yes. What was that? In, in my case, um, I, had, I had been bleeding into my brain for several days before I went to the hospital. And I was... I, I became unconscious when I got there. I fell out of the truck and I became unconscious. And they put me in a CAT scan machine to find out what was happening to me. And I was unconscious that whole time. And then when I came to, I was on a table in a very quiet uh, um, emergency room, which is never good when it's like no one's in there, just the doctor, no one's running around, nobody's doing anything urgently. You wake up and you're like, oh. <laughs> oh, God. Right? And the yeah. doctor is just looking at me so compassionately. And I was like, oh. And so I said, am I dying? Because I realized this is a bad situation. This is way too quiet. Nobody's helping. Nothing's happening. And he stroked my hair. And I thought, oh, yep. Oh <laughs> Yippers. And he said, um, you're bleeding into your brain. And I was like, oh, OK. So I, I called my mom. and. Uh, and then he said that they were going to transfer me to a neurological hospital, that they didn't have what I needed. And so they put me on this um, gurney that they were going to be able to move so that the ambulance could take me elsewhere. And once I got on that gurney, all of a sudden, that was it. And I was just gone. And I felt myself kind of do this sweep upwards. And there was this just like tunnel of light. And I was swooping up through this tunnel of light. And at the top of it was kind of a hole. And 
several people that I had been very close to or had been their caretakers until they died were kind of looking down like this through that open hole at the top and looking at me and I felt like they were kind of telling me, this is all great, this is all fine, this is gonna be wonderful. And I felt like, oh, I'm gonna be with you guys, this is okay. And I was really moving quickly. It was like the tunnel was miles and miles long and I was just whoosh. And then all of a sudden I felt like, and I don't know if they defibrillated me or if something happened, but I felt like I got really kicked in the chest really, really hard. And I felt like I kind of went like, <gasps> like that. And I, <gasps> and sat up and I was back in the emergency room on the gurney. And um, someone said, you know, what's happening? And the doctor said, don't touch her, don't touch her. And the doctor said, what do you need? And I said, I really have to pee. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he just pointed to the bathroom. Like he felt like no one should touch me. And I remember looking down and thinking like that the floor was very far away, like very far. And I thought, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna get down. You know, it just seemed like I was floating. And it just, and then they took me to the other hospital. Um, it was really, it was very strange. It was very beautiful, very strange. And then it was like, I went to the other hospital. They gave me uh, a lot of different things happened, bad and good. But ultimately, they gave me an angiogram. They missed my brain, brain bleed. And then I continued to bleed into my brain for like another maybe five or six days. And they thought that um, I was faking it. And I guess, because they must think I'm a really fabulous actress. <laughs> well, you are. But uh, eventually, they were going to send me home. And I, my, I said to my best friend, you know, I I'm dying. I'm, I'm, I'm dying. And she said, OK. And she went out and just threw a fit and said, you cannot send her home. Nobody sleeps 20 hours a day. She's, she's, you know, she's going in and out of a coma. You can't send her home. And so they agreed to give me another angiogram, but she leaves after that. And so they gave me another angiogram and they realized that my vertebral artery had completely ruptured and I'd been bleeding into my brain for all this time. And so I had a seven hour surgery and they put like 22, 23 coils in place of my artery. And I, I survived a very, very difficult surgery. And when I woke up, they told me what happened. And I was like, oh, you've got to get this, because I was on Dilaudid, which is like a synthetic heroin. And uh, I said, oh, you've got to get this out of my arm. And they said, oh, no, we can't, because you'll have a seizure. You have to step down off of this. And I was like, oh, now I'm like a drug addict, right? <laughs> this is horrible. And so they moved me to intensive care to get me off of the drugs. So it was, it was quite a journey. It was, uh, it was really... And, and, and I, I hate to mention it, but it was like, I think like um, 10 days after 9-11. So all those images were playing on the TV and everybody was so freaked out. And, you know, so the whole world was upside down. But I think that this is what's so great about the book that you've, that you've written. You talk with such honesty and you, there's so much of your... There's so much of your life, of your, of your being, which is really about just being a force for good. Like, right. I, I think your work with Amphar is oh. incredible and so underappreciated. And so many people tell me stories <laughs> about <laughs> you as an auctioneer. And the first, like, what was it like the first time you took a microphone? And you as an auctioneer, I've heard, why, why is it yours? What do you do as an auctioneer? And why you, do you think you're so good at raising? I mean, you must have raised hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. for that charity. In the beginning, I was not good. I was shy. And because, you know, personally, you know, I'm very shy. And I was very nervous the first time. And then as I got into it, I realized I had to kind of invent a character. As, yeah. as we do. You have to invent a character if you're going to 
be on stage doing this. You just can't. I tried to do it like myself, and I was crying, and I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And then I kind of invented this character that is the auctioneer character. And she's kind of um, dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and loves to pick people out of the room and say really crazy things to them. You know, like, I will ask, uh, I remember Calvin Klein was in one of the audiences, and I said, you know, he'll give me, I started at five grand, he'll give me five grand to see if Calvin has, actually has on Calvin Klein underwear. And, you know, so we raised a bunch of money, and then Calvin had to open his pants and show us his <laughs> underwear. And I'll just, you know, if you were there, I would just make you do something. And do you know what? <laughs> I'd do it. Because I, I, <laughs> I think that is the takeaway from this book. And the takeaway is never let it be said anything other than Sharon Stone, I think, is an absolute force for good. And her memoir, The Beauty of Living yeah. Twice, is brilliant and it's available everywhere <laughs> you get your book.